the result of the war in Ukraine. As a result of the war in Ukraine, despite the lessons learned during COVID. Um, we have a, a, a list of different people. They'll be presented as each speaker takes the floor. I'm just now doing the welcoming as well as the introduction. As far as housekeeping is concerned, we will have captions and international sign uh, link, sign available. Um, you have a link which you can copy and paste in the chat. There's also the button that you can press. Um, you are to put your questions in the uh, your question and answer box, your questions and question and answer box and the chat and speakers will keep off their cameras until it's time for them to speak. Um, let's see if I forgot anything. This is being recorded so that we can have it on the website, the YouTube channel for the European Network on Independent Living. If that's, if Enos doesn't have anything to add there, we'll go to the background of the side event, which is the war in Ukraine, where we're seeing that people are being moved to institutions. There's a memorandum of understanding between the government of Ukraine and EU countries to keep children in the institutions. Calls for more institutions in the EU and then for investing in institutions in Ukraine after the war is over, which is very worrisome for us. This is all despite the CRPD and lessons learned during COVID. And when people are in institutions, we know that they're in vulnerable situations and face many breaches of human rights. I will um, stop there and give the floor to our first uh, speaker, who is Drag Ganasiri Malavalic, I'm sorry for the pronunciation, Director for Europe for the Disability Rights International. She'll speak about children from Ukraine's institutions, our bilateral agreements between governments as a threat to DI process in Europe. And please, um, Dragana, we know that you've just published two reports on institutions in Ukraine, which are exposing horrific conditions. What do we know about children from these institutions in the bilateral agreements between governments, please? Thank you very much, Amy. Um, and thank you for the invitation to speak at today's side event. Um, what we were already afraid of and lessons learned after COVID uh, shown us that the invasion of Ukraine by Russian forces have turned already existing human rights crisis, which is institutionalization of children and adults with disabilities and it turned it into absolute catastrophe. And what we were able to see uh, from the beginning of the war, uh, we've been monitoring the situation of children in institutions in Ukraine. What we were able to see is that while children with uh, without disabilities were uh, evacuated first and further into European Union, uh, children with disabilities were mostly left behind are either in institutions to shelter in place or were transferred to institutions in West uh, of the country where already overcrowded places have become uh, extremely uh, understaffed and overcrowded um, with, with no other place to uh, stay. Uh, so uh, some children with disabilities were transferred further uh, abroad to European Union countries. Um, and the memorandum of understanding that I will spoke about briefly, uh, I will explain what it is about. But what I wanted to say is that um, first, uh, Disability Rights International warned about the situation back in 2014 when Russia invaded the east of the country, we did a report then. Um, and while we expressed all the concerns, issued recommendations, nothing was done to prevent this catastrophe that we are witnessing right now. So uh, one month ago, uh, DRI issued another report left uh, behind in the war. Uh, and my colleagues have just came back from the second visit to Ukrainian institutions um, 
and the findings were um, as they were first time. So really desperate, desperate situation in institutions in the West of Ukraine, where children with disabilities uh, were transferred from Eastern part of the country. So at the beginning of the war, Ukrainian government uh, reached out to 23 countries of uh, European Union and some neighboring countries uh, and invited them to sign bilateral memorandum on protection of children's rights from vulnerable categories. Um, what we know from before the war, uh, official records show that uh, around 100,000 children with and without disabilities are actually placed uh, in institutions in Ukraine. There are numbers that vary, but basically uh, we're talking about one of the highest rate of institutionalization for both children and adults in the country. Uh, and what uh, we, uh, after, after the war and when, when we heard about the, these agreements, uh, it was that uh, Ukrainian government has basically uh, encouraged uh, placement of children from Ukraine in institution in EU member states, which is in contravention uh, of the European Union's and member states obligations under the EU and international law. So uh, in response to the war and the need to protect children in territories affected by the countries, the government of Ukraine draft the Memorandum of Understanding, uh, insisting on two, uh, two problematic points besides some of them that really do uh, take care of protection of children's rights, such as ban on international adoptions and some other issues about registration. But two problematic provisions are one that says that children arriving from institutions uh, have to be kept together and placed in institutions in receiving countries. And the second one is that uh, children who were transferred from institutions into European Union countries have to be returned back to institutional placement. So these are obviously uh, big concerns because as a result of this, some member states have already uh, signal the need for extension of their existing childcare institutions or the need to build new ones. Uh, and considering the resources required for the building of new facilities, their renovation or extension, it is likely that member states will officially request support from EU funds. And according to some of the latest information, Poland has already submitted such a request to the European Commission. And we know that some of the more recent members of the European Union, such as Romania and neighboring countries, Moldova, they have already struggled to deinstitutionalize children within their own countries. And now with the influx of children coming from Ukraine, that, that system has become really overstretched and they can hardly meet the needs of uh, both of the children uh, who have already resided in these countries and furthermore children arriving from Ukraine. So we are definitely facing uh, a big threat of uh, further uh, deepening of the crisis, already human rights crisis, which institutionalization co constitutes itself. We are now facing uh, a big challenge of reinstitutionalization uh, and expanding of institutions uh, throughout European Union and neighboring countries as well. So uh, I sincerely hope that uh, the guidelines on the, in the institutionalization that are being drafted and also uh, that this call for uh, uh, of warning will help us address uh, this issue and prevent further uh, human rights violations of children and adults with disabilities in institutional settings. Thank you. And thank you, Dragana, for that very dark picture. We're happy that you're the watchdog that you are trying to keep yeah, showing us these pictures so that we can raise the issues so high on the agenda. And yet it's 
scary to see the development, fortunately. But okay, we'll go from there to the next speaker. And that's Lucas or Liske uh, from this Disability Rights. Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, sorry about that. Disability Rights Campaigner from Poland. Uh, Lucas, please. Uh, you have to speak about the arrival of disabled refugees in Poland and how that's also led to further in investments in institutions. Please, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a honor to speak during today's meeting. Uh, we are talking about the institutionalization in the context of the war in Ukraine. However, I cannot fail to mention the situation of the small town Yordanov in, a, in a, uh, southeastern Poland. The Polish media reported yesterday that physical and psychological violence was being committed in the local 24 hours institution run by one of the, run by one of the women's order. The institution has been in operation for five years, for, 50, for 15 years. According to the latest figures, 47 girls and women under the age of 25 with intellectual disabilities live there. <clears throat> An inspection conducted two years ago did not reveal any signs of violence. After the media reports, a new inspection was ordered. I would like to emphasize that the expansion of the facility, of the mission facility during the years uh, 2007 and 2013 was financed by the European Regional Fund. Let us return to the subject of my speech. According to the official statistics of the Polish Rehabilitation Funds for the, the Disabled uh, of, uh, of People with Disabilities, from the end of February to 25th May, there were uh, 366 people with disabilities at so-called so reception points at the Polish border. Probably uh, many more people are still staying with families or in places organized by uh, NGOs. <clears throat> the Polish Rehabilitation Fund subsides individuals to purchase equipment such as wheelchairs, coverers, and insulin pumps. Also, for example, crutches and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, the subsidies for individuals that are coming from the Ukraine because of the war. So these rehabilitation funds fund also subsidize the NGOs uh, activities in the field in the fields of organizations of organization rehabilitation and medical as well as psychological therapy, with as well as the support in entering the label market in Poland. So far, 1,373 uh, people uh, from the Ukrainian refugees with disabilities benefited from this support. Neither this rehabilitation fund nor uh, the Ministry of Social Affair, Affairs, who has uh, uh, owned the the special fund called the Solidarity Fund uh, from this fund is uh, giving them, uh, the ministry is giving the money to, uh, to uh, organizations that, uh, or, that organizes uh, uh, personal assistance in Poland, but only for Polish citizens. Uh, so neither a rehabilitation fund nor the ministry enabled the Ukrainian citizens to benefit from the personal assistance on the actual basis with Polish citizens. Although personal assistance in Poland is not implemented in full, uh, 
in full company as with general comment five, general comment five, even such assistance is needed by persons from Ukraine. In, in absence of this, uh, it is impossible for people with disabilities to leave the places where they live. Even if the NGOs do not intend to create an institution, uh, such places of, resi of residence become the institutions because in practical in practice people living there live very regularly and does not decide about the very daily schedule. <clears throat> Local organizations such as Go Ahead Foundation from Col from Conin, it is a rather uh, medium city uh, for Polish conditions. I think 100,000 inhabitants in general, which so such organizations, uh, they help a small number of people in the planet, in planet wave. The way is planned together with those Ukrainian refugees. At the beginning, uh, this organization organized housing and food for these persons in very hostel. So uh, they, they act as, uh, this foundation act as uh, a social enterprise and they own a hostel uh, for commercial aims. But uh, nowadays, they keep uh, space in the hostel to the Ukrainian refugees. They also have to arrange local uh, legal issues referred related to their stay in Poland. They finance medical rehabilitation of people from Ukraine. Gradually, they help these people uh, to find an apartment and a job in a local community. But I have to stress that unfortunately, even this kind of organization of organizations do not organize personal assistance on a larger scale. scale. Unfortunately, we, don't, we do not know how many people from Ukraine live in Poland <coughs> in places that officially are called institutions. Deaf people are in very difficult situation because almost nobody knows Ukrainian sign language. But in Poznan, where I live, thanks to the great effort of the TON organization, more than 200 deaf people live in the local community. Most of them work. So deaf people who originally live in other cities in Poland or even in Germany are coming to Poznan. Thank you for your attention. And thank you, Lucas, for this um, description of Poland and the emphasis when that this, um, the refugees are not accessing the same services that the citizens do. And then without that, it's very difficult to live a life of integration and to access work. From there, I go over to my own um, contribution to this meeting, where I was uh, talk, asked to talk about lessons learned from the Swedens on the institutionalization process. Um, I mean, Sweden closed the larger institutions back in January 2000. And this was a political decision. It was a political decision taken in spite of the fact that over 85% of people were against the decisions. This means politicians, people working for the uh, working in the institutions, working for the municipalities, parents, people themselves living in, in the institutions. But due to the breaches, the violence that was being faced in the institutions, at this time, back in the 80s, 90s, they decided to close these larger institutions. And afterwards, most people were satisfied. Parents saw that their children had a better life. People who lived in the institutions themselves realized that they could live a good life with, with um, support on their own. And they found having their name on the door for the first time in their life was a fantastic feeling. There were some um, cases of people with uh, mental health problems that don't always fare so well. And it's a question of the support that they have in the country. So there's no system as of yet that's perfect. 
Um, to close the institutions, there needed to be new laws that were passed. The main one was the LSS legislation, which provided 10 uh, social services, including the right to housing, uh, which is group homes, and also to personal assistance, which allow people to live in their own homes. The process for the institutionalization started already back in the 80s, and then it continued in the 90s with this deadline for the 1st of January. Many group homes were built in Sweden, which we're seeing the case in other countries, which we find uh, not in accordance with the UNCRPD. Because even if you only have six or seven people living there, if people don't have access to self-determination, full participation, they're not living lives uh, independently in the society. Um, the Independent Living Institute, where I work, we just completed a paper on the closing of the institutions, where we also list the different uh, access to social services that were needed to be able to do so. I had hoped to have that link here today, but there's a little bit of a delay. So if you keep keep uh, keep an eye on the email news newslines newsletter, or the news, we'll get that link to you quite soon. Um, what we've seen is that even in Sweden, as you were saying, Lucas, and that because that people don't, uh, they have high needs of support, uh, uh, high, need, high level needs, the, the, the people coming from Ukraine. So they're being put into institutions even here in Sweden, which I was, yeah, sad to learn this and angry to learn this. Well, though the excuse is that, okay, it's the need of care and it's the need of access, accessibility. But it's also, as Lucas was saying, that if you don't access the same services, such as personal assistance or other services, then, then, you, then you can't live on your own or in a, in a, in a flat with your family. Um, and this is, yeah, the process then starts. So when you start talking about work, we're excluding this, this uh, group of the group of people, disabled people from the very beginning. I think I will stop there and present Adrian Goretsky from the Healthcare Education Institute, who will speak on the experience of supporting refugees with rare diseases and lessons learned. Your organization is supporting people with rare diseases who need support, but also medical interventions. Some may end up in institutions if support is not there. Can you highlight some good examples? Thank you. The floor is yours, Adrian. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you for the invitation for today. Well, uh, as, I, as, as just Jamie said, I am dealing with patients with rare diseases, uh, which is uh, a group of patients. Let me just maybe share my screen to show your presentation a little bit, uh, at least to depict uh, the situation. Where is the full screen here? I mean, it's of course a little bit different than, than, than uh, this is not just about disability, but of course this, this is a large group of people, those with rare diseases, and lots of them, I cannot I have statistics regarding Ukraine, but lots of them are um, disabled, have disabilities, also physical and mental ones. And therefore we faced uh, a totally new obstacles, because we're before the war, we were a foundation dealing with rare diseases on the legal and scientific level. I am a lawyer by profession, but well, we responded for a call to help. And so far we moved over 60 families from Ukraine uh, to Poland, 60 families, uh, 60 patients with given rare diseases. As we also cooperate with many other entities helping uh, patients with specific rare diseases in um, Poland, they also helped Ukrainians. So I would like to give you a little bit of background what is the current situation in um, those patients in Poland. Uh, I must echo what Wukash said, generally speaking, the situation is not good. I would like to speak on the good examples and I will, but first of all, I, am, I need to depict the current situation of uh, Ukrainian refugees. And uh, what we did is to first of all, transport those people through the border and from Ukraine. It was the first obstacle for people with both mental illnesses, but also physical disabilities. I mean, how to transport them 
to the border when there were uh, long waiting lines. Uh, therefore, we organized a transport, medical transport for some of them, but it was just, you know, our initiative and looking for contacts on both sides of the border rather than any kind of organized help. And then, well, in Poland, generally speaking, has problem with flats and with housing, and it's generally speaking, a nationwide problem. And uh, you can also imagine how, how hard it's to find a proper flat for, for example, for a person in a wheelchair. So it's a couple of times harder than finding a proper flat for a uh, for healthy uh, individual. Therefore, it was another problem. And this is still a problem to, to find the proper flat and not to pay for the flat like million dollars for per, per month. So this was another problem. What we did and what we successfully did is to provide uh, specialized, specialized care for all those people. I mean, medical care. This was our job. And this, was the, uh, this is the area of our expertise. So we managed to uh, find the proper specialist to all the people, regardless of their disease, even though there was like, like a disease, there were five cases worldwide. And we really looked for a neurologist to take care of, of a child on a wheelchair with a neurodegenerative disease. Nevertheless, we, uh, we uh, succeed. Another thing is legal support and the legal situation of Ukrainians uh, here in um, Poland. As I said, I'm a lawyer and uh, we are trying to do as much as possible to help those people. What Ukash said is right regarding the Disability Fund, uh, it's called uh, PEFRON in Polish, Państwowe Fundusze Habilitacji Osób Niepełnosprawnych. And yes, they've got the separate budget for Ukrainians and they can cover some like, their expenses, but there is but, and there is always but. And when you, when you are a lawyer, there's always but. But there is a problem with medical rehabilitation. I mean, it is not funded uh, for Ukrainian citizens on the same rights as for Polish. It is funded from PEFRON, from this fund, but it is not funded from the uh, health um, insurance. They've got the whole, the same right as Polish citizens, but not when it comes to medical rehabilitation. So if we got, if we got for example, somebody after a stroke uh, on the witcher and wanting to um, have medical rehabilitation, yes, it's possible, but only paid one. Or from this Pethron found, but not on, let's say, going to the, to the, to the uh, physician and taking a prescription for rehabilitation. And uh, well, this is still the uh, issue. Um, this is what we did. I mean, this is a presentation showing what we did and did during the war. I mean, we uh, we did our best, but still, when it comes to institutions, unfortunately, yes, this is still a problem in Poland, as you perfectly know. Uh, this is uh, now even subject of a nationwide discussion, as also Kash indicated after this uh, this horror, which was revealed in one of the institutions in Poland. But this is not the first case, and. Unfortunately, probably on the last case when there is a uh, such a problem in the institution, regardless is it a church one or a say, civil one or state run one, as we all here know, this is a problem. But when it comes to Ukrainian patients, yes, they also came from institutions. And yes, I know that they are placed from an institution to an institution in Poland. And uh, there are even some legal agreements uh, between Polish and Ukrainian um, states uh, regarding moving the whole, the, the, the institutions as a whole to Poland. We did everything to avoid doing it. I mean, there is a one example that we can share. Uh, we placed, uh, but I mean, not we, but we managed, we, we did the say legal part, but also moved those people through the border. And uh, we placed people with a specific disease um, called EB, to say severe skin disease. And uh, people are um, disabled, uh, physically disabled, uh, sometimes very severely. And we placed them um, uh, in a house run by the, by the foundation, by an NGO called Stella Foundation in one of the Polish cities. And they, this was a, hub for them. I mean, they had a chance to um, to spend a month, a couple of weeks there. 
Uh, in the meantime, the foundation was looking for uh, individual accommodation for them. So it was like a hub. It was like a point where they could obtain medical assistance, dressings, which were which are um, uh, very important when it comes to this disease, and they need to be uh, those patients need to have those dressings changed a couple times a day, so they had a uh, access to free of charge dressing there. They lived in this common house, say let's say that's ten families or something like this, a little bit more, but they are. Uh, the foundation looked for individual flats and they were placed there. So it was like a temporary temporary uh, solution. But also please be aware that lots of uh, Ukrainians uh, live in such kind of institutions, despite the fact that they are um, healthy individuals. I mean, there are no refugee camps in Poland. And this is fantastic. but. They are, uh, there are Ukrainians being placed in uh, some kind of common accommodations, uh, like in schools, like in, in uh, some kind of uh, buildings which belongs to the state or the local authorities. And well, even healthy people are being placed there, being placed in, in say, institutions. Because there are not, there's not, not enough flats, there's no enough uh, uh, flats which are uh, achievable. I mean, which are cheap enough to be to, to 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 be rented by Ukrainians. And let's say there are no flats that are cheap enough to be rented by Polish citizens as well. So we face a humanitarian catastrophe. Uh, we uh, face a housing catastrophe right now in Poland. And the situation isn't very well for patients with disabilities uh, from uh, Ukraine, because also, as I said, uh, there is uh, no uh, proper medical rehabilitation. As you can see, when it comes to our statistics, uh, most of the uh, people were um, children, and because those, those were the first evacuated. And as you will see um, on our probably one of the next slides. If not, I will tell you the statistics. Uh, it's about 60% of people who stood st stayed in Poland and the rest uh, after a while went, um, went from, the, uh, for, left from Poland to other countries. Just let me take a look at my notes and maybe stop sharing my screen if I said everything they wanted to say. Uh, I don't know where to stop sharing the screen. Here. Okay. Mm. Okay. Okay. And the last thing that I would like to underline is that that uh, people with disabilities are entitled to take advantage of Polish social care, uh, pro which are which is guaranteed by Polish disability law, but they need to uh, provide all the medical uh, documentation in Polish, or Swan translated, uh, or given by a Polish physician, and the whole procedure is in Polish. So in theory, they have the same right as Polish citizens, but in practice it's very limited because it's, it requires Polish medical records and uh, Polish, I mean, filling the form in Polish and so on and so on. Some local authorities provide help for Ukrainians, some not, so this the situation is not stable. Uh, well, okay. it's just summarizing. Let me get this. this let me, let yeah, me, you can uh, just, say your just, closure, maybe. Yeah, my closure is that the situation is not good. And uh, if there were people who were uh, living independently in Ukraine, it's highly likely that they are not living independently in Poland. And really, the uh, only um, address where to address. Uh, such appeals is, uh, I mean, the Ministry of Health, the Polish authorities. This is the right institution. I mean, we as NGOs, as many NGOs, we are not capable of changing the landscape right now. This, this must be done on the highest possible level, um, engaging Polish authorities. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Adrian. And um, for the good example of the people that you are helping, but also more stories about what's not working in this process. And from there, and the next speaker is Katrin Langen-Siepen, who is an MEP on the role of European Parliament. 
and promoting the CRPD compliance and including in the time of wars and other emergencies. Uh, Katrine, knowing that some EU member states are already asking for money for more institutions and that Ukraine is now being considered for EU membership despite very high rates of institutionalization of disabled people and other human rights abuses. What is the parliament doing to prevent the misuse of EU funds mm -hmm. in the member states, but also in neighboring countries and Ukraine? Thank you. The floor is yours. First of all, thanks for the invitation. Um, greetings from New York, from the EU office um, here. Um, and my MEP colleagues and, and I, we are here today, tomorrow, and on Thursday. Um, the world comes together uh, when it comes to the rights of persons with disabilities. The situation for persons with disabilities, children with disabilities is, um, let's call it difficult, no diplomatic um, description. Uh, we do have uh, still the fact that member states are sticking to institutions. Um, the country where I'm coming from, Germany, uh, we have, for example, the highest rate of persons with disabilities in sheltered workshops. So institutions is, um, uh, we have different versions of uh, places where you work and places where you live, or both you live and work um, on the same, uh, in the same area, and that is more dangerous. Um, it's very, very difficult to change that view. Um, it's not like in Sweden. And um, we had last weekend, um, on, on Twitter in Germany, a very, um, yeah, uh, famous hashtag, uh, you abuse us, you utilize us, kind of that, where persons in sheltered workshops um, are talking, uh, what happened to them and for which kind of amount they are working. It is, until now, uh, not really, um, regular that refugees, uh, and we in Germany had a situation that many people from Syria came, uh, traumatized people. Um, you had cases that some of them um, had to work in sheltered workshops. That is of course not what we want, but it happens. We on the European level, uh, in the European Parliament, we have it clear, no funds to institutions, sheltered workshops, kind of that, who are against the Article 27. That is our clear political demand. Um, you have it in different papers. We have it um, in the strategy. And when it comes to funding, our commissioner, Helena Dali, promised us, and I asked her in an audition in, in the committee, um, that she will uh, have an eye on or support it that no money will be misused. But it is um, sometimes more difficult than, than just saying. And we do have structured and a well, well functional system where everyone is benefiting from accepting persons with disabilities. The issue of persons with disabilities from Ukraine is, um, it is an issue, but not a real loud issue. We have in different debates, um, and I'm flagging that, my colleagues, um, the situation of persons with disabilities, but it is, mm, regarding um, the, the situation in Ukraine, difficult to, um, to support. And what, our, um, what one of the speakers this morning said on a side event on Ukraine and persons with disabilities is, persons with disabilities are not visible. And people who are not visible um, are not in public. And so you don't have these groups on your agenda. And that is the issue and that is a problem. Deinstitutionalization um, is like uh, questioning a holy cow. 
um, but we from the parliament side are here crystal clear. In Germany, we have different political uh, structure. We are a federal state, for example, not a central state. Um, that makes it a bit difficult to organizing um, help and support. And um, when it comes to funding, we um, reflect in the European Parliament that when we have the child guarantee, please be aware of children with disabilities, especially from Ukraine. And we are only talking about Ukraine. We are not talking about persons with disabilities from other countries. Um, that is a long run. That is a long, um, long journey when it comes to the deinstitutionalization. Um, and the, the negative example is always Great Britain or kind of Sweden. Uh, we say, okay, you close the institutions and, and the people were at home. Um, that is the pressure they, um, the pro um, activists on institutionalization um, are always flagging it and say, okay, look at Great Britain, what happened there? And today the people are alone at home. When it comes to the institutions and what, yeah, children with disabilities um, were brought to institutions in Germany. I always flex the point, please have an eye on what happened in these institutions. There is no um, clear awareness and still the belief if it's in a social and mostly Christian lad institutions, it must be automatically a good one. And here um, we should be very, very aware of what happened to the children, um, that they don't um, come into surroundings or in an environment where they are completely lost uh, deaf children sitting in a non-deaf um, society, for example. Um, so, and that is, of course, due to the number, the high number of refugees, persons with disabilities, difficult to arrange. And my Polish previous speaker said it right. Um, we will have a, a housing issue. It is a housing problem. We have already housing problems in the European Union. And to get or give them apartments where people with disabilities can live independently. So what happened to Poland or in Poland, we have a similar situation in Germany. So the country is close to the Hungarian border. That is not such a big issue. For example, in Portugal or Spain, um, the people go to Germany, they are in Poland, they are in the Ukrainian neighbor countries. And here we have resolutions, we have a new EU disability strategy, and it is flagging and saying it loud in public um, to be aware of or have persons with disabilities into account. That is what we are fighting for from the parliament side. Um, I have five minutes um, of speaking time. That is more than I have normally in the parliament. Um, and uh, yeah, we have adopted resolutions when it comes to children in Ukraine or refugee children. And we are not only talking about the specific situation of persons with disabilities. It's unfortunately always a side note. And uh, here we must be politically very sensitive and loud. And here I ask for allyship. We need the NGOs, we need um, persons with disabilities on board, nothing about us without us. It's still always a fight to have NGOs on the table when it comes to, because you are the operators, you know the best what is good or bad for persons with disabilities. So politicians or parliaments or political structures should ask the people with disabilities. Sounds normal, sounds yeah, understandable, but it is. Um, that is my short um, statement from the parliament side. I'm really looking forward um, and say thank you for the floor. Thank you very much, Katrin, and for your messages that you need the NGOs and we need you and that the will, we were fighting that there will be no more funding, even though we know 
that there is a question of visibility and being on top of the agenda. But thank you. We'll go to the next speaker before we get um, to the question and answers. While the next speaker is speaking, if you do have questions, uh, write them either in the chat box or in the Q&A. Thank you. And the next and last speaker for today is Amalia Gamio, who is the vice chair of the committee on the rights of persons with disabilities and member of the working group on DI. We want to say again, congratulations for being reelected. We're happy about that. Um, you'll talk about the draft of the, guide, uh, the guidelines and the committee, which the committee is working on and has published the draft last month. Do you think that they will be uh, of use to prevent investments in institutions by governments, but also private actors? Thank you very much, Amalia. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be here, thanks to European Network on Independent Living for inviting me. Um, if only we could have prevented and avoided having millions of persons around the world living in isolation against their will, receiving involuntary and hum inhuman treatment, children deprived of their right to grow up, in a family, practices that international law clearly contemplates as torture, things would be very different now. In the 21 century, when it was possible to create a vaccine to prevent COVID-19 in record time, persons with psychosocial and intellectual disabilities continue to face practices of the Inquisition. Why? Most legislation around the world fails to respect, protect, and fulfill the rights of persons with disabilities, denying them the right to equality before the law in violation of Article 12 of the Convention and its general comment number one, which requires respect for, for a person's legal capacity and decision-making at all times, including in crisis situations. Governors and societies combine ignorance, discrimination, and stigma when they do not understand the need to demedicalize psychosocial or intellectual disability. The link between disability and criminalization leaves persons with disabilities without liability to the law and deprives them of a fair trial, clearly opposed to the convention, as pointed out in guidelines in Article 14. Uh, as part of the CRPD and its working group of the institutionalization, I thank the Global Coalition for the invaluable support it has given to us in the draft of guidelines. The guidelines are important to prevent investment in institutions. Yes, <clears throat> sorry, because they highlight the devastating effect effects of segregation and reaffirm the Convention's prohibition on the built new hospitals. The guidelines demedicalize psychosocial disability by removing it, it from the patient position and focusing on environmental factors that help them to be included in, this, in their society. They highlight the importance of Article 4, 19, and its general comment five, emphasizing the fundamental premise of the participation of persons with disabilities, stakeholders, peers, friends, family and community members in the institutionalization process, help to all them and governments to define plans and programs, taking into account the need for legislative legislative harmonization, the transition process, right to equality, non-discrimination, access to justice, individual support, obtaining housing, decent work, health care, and more, all in the community and giving importance to statistics. The guidelines address the intersectionalities of persons with psychosocial and intellectual disabilities because they are women, children, elderly, indigenous, facing multiple discriminations. Because persons with disabilities have been subject to control and oppression in institutions of, of all kinds, 
covering up serious violations of their rights, the guidelines use transitional justice by seeking remedy, reparation, and redress. We should not wait for catastrophes before the institutionalization. As we heard from Dragana, recent disability rights international visit to Ukraine shown that persons with disabilities in isolation have been left beh more behind during the war. In pandemic or wars, those who left because of, of that should not return to the institutions. Finally, I would like to emphasize that the ideological, political, sanitary and legal framework that sustains the mental health system from its space of power resists change. This is clearly seen with the construction of new psychiatric facilities in Europe, even though it is totally contrary to the convention. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you, Amalia, for your contribution and for talking about the guidelines and what they're bringing up and the need to demedicalize the issue of intersectionality. Yes, so many issues that you did bring. Thank you. We'll start now the um, question and answer where I know that I have Dragana who would like to start and speak as a, um, in reference to uh, Adrian's uh, contribution. Please, Jagana. Uh, thank you very much, Jamie. Uh, I just wanted to point out the danger of saying uh, that even healthy people are institutionalized. We know very well that yes, everybody's facing crisis and we are indeed facing humanitarian crisis in general when it comes to uh, people fleeing Ukraine. But what we also know is that especially children with disabilities and adults with disabilities who are placed in institutions are staying there their entire lives. So we cannot compare people who have choice to leave, who are currently maybe placed in um, uh, group settings, but we know that they won't stay there. We have to be aware that when it comes to children with disabilities and adults with disabilities, it is almost taken as given that that's where they will remain. We know that kids who uh, go to institutions uh, when they're born, they're staying there for a lifetime. So we have to be aware of that and not uh, get into a trap to compare the situation of non-disabled and disabled individuals. So thank you. Yes, and thank you for that. I agree with you very much on that issue. Um, we have one question. Uh, Adrian has his hand up as a comment, I think, and then I have another question for Amalia. Please, Adrian. It is a question for me. Well, yes, I do. The question I have for you is, um, do you think the committee can take any action if there are violations of the CRPD like this MOU? The member of understanding. Wait, Peter, could you repeat me, please? I'm sorry. I said, do you think that the committee can take any action on the violations of the CRPD like this member of understanding? Yes, of course. Um, after pandemic, we we are uh, really committed to. Uh, of course, we we make the the the, the, the institutionalization working group first of all, and um, we uh, we have uh, consultations with persons with psychosocial and intellectual disabilities in seven regions. This is another important actions that, uh, that we take. And uh, then the draft of the institutionalization guidelines, but uh, um, and we put to consult consultation this draft in the website of the committee. But of course, we are um, putting more attention into give in the recommendation to the states parties um, the instruction. I mean, the recommendation that they should 
should use this these uh, guidelines of the institutionalization because uh, the convention is it, it was into enforce since 15 years ago and we are at the same situation the institutionalization is not contemplate in many of the states parties of the convention so we are concerned about and we are taking many many actions in regard to thank you but just an add to that though just an add to that though the MOU that's saying that they sh that the uh, the EU and the government and Ukraine are signing under that the children should be kept in the institutions. Um, is there something that we can do about that? Can I have a comment to what uh, Joseph Fragano said? Okay, thank you. Adrian, if you would like to go ahead, and then maybe I'm ready after that. I will continue without the video, sorry. Um, when it comes to what I would like to say, it's that, that we uh, did a survey among those uh, families that we help, and uh, the overwhelming majority uh, treats the situation as a temporary one. So, well, I also say, I also have no indications not to treat the situation as a temporary one. I mean, they would like to go back to Ukraine. And what, was, what, what will be their situation in Ukraine? I don't know. Now, maybe some of them, well, not our families, but let's, some of them can be placed in the institutions. But let's say again, I believe they are treating and everybody is thinking about their situation as a temporary one. And that's not like they placed in the institution in Poland and they will stay there forever. I mean, we cannot, um, predict what will be the situation with their situation after war uh, in Ukraine, if they will be placed in the institution again or not, probably yes, which is sad, but well, when it comes to Poland, we think about uh, everything, what we, what we do, we think about this as a temporary solution, maybe for a longer time, like for 12 months or something like this, but well, this is still temporary and they're also thinking, I can assure you, the, according to the results of our survey among those who we helped, they are thinking about staying in the EU as a temporary solution. Not They are not uh, going to stay here forever, no, no matter what are the uh, circumstances, I mean, the environment that they came in, yes. Maybe if there are patients who are in the institutions in Ukraine and went to Poland or any other, let's say maybe not to Poland, because this is not a good example, but to well-developed country with, with a proper uh, the institutionalization level and, and uh, ability to have an off flat, maybe they won't come back to Ukraine, but let's say that the majority of them uh, are going back to Ukraine after the war is over. This is uh, their uh, statement, uh, not only in our survey, but this, this is a general uh, statement of those with rare diseases who fled uh, the war. Okay, thank you for that information. I have Amalia, if you want to, your hand is up, and then after that, Lucas. Yes, thank you, Jamie, briefly. I insist in, uh, this is an opportunity, pandemic and wars are an opportunity to don't back to the people, to institutions. And uh, maybe one solution could be that the, 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 the children that are in a, Poland or in Germany, uh, so civil society could could make an, an effort to find a, 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 um, a family substituted uh, and they don't come back to a, an institution in Ukraine, for example. This, I mean, there are many, many uh, pos possible solutions like uh, Disability Rights International or, or even your organization have done. It, it, this is an opportunity. We can lose this opportunity to don't return persons with disability to institutions. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, statement as well as this as looking as at it as an opportunity. I think we can remind ourselves of that and hope usually there is good things that come out of crisis. Lucas, please, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. I would like to refer to the uh, Adrian's opinion because no one of us uh, know uh, where the, this war will will uh, will end. So um, this is one point, and uh, I don't know the the statistics across Poland, but from my local experience in the Wielkopolska region, I can say that many of uh, those refugees would like to stay in Poland. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the more difficulties they have in daily living, they are more likely to stay. Because, uh, because uh, in, Ukrainian, in, in Ukraine, they don't have uh, contact with the, uh, with the idea, even the idea of independent, independent living. And in Poland, they do have. So uh, I uh, I would like to emphasize that that uh, uh, I hope I hope that that uh, one day uh, we, they will uh, they will use their personal assistance service on equal basis as the Polish citizens, even if, as I already said before, even uh, the Polish system of personal assistance is far from the ideal. Thank you. Well, I base only on the results of surveys that we conducted. And also I, were, I, I, I really would like to uh, have such situation as you mentioned that they will be able to use uh, make use of the Polish system, which is not perfect, as you perfectly know, but well, it is working to some extent. And uh, well, I hope that they will have a chance, well, maybe not only in Poland, but in other countries. I'm just referring to what they are saying. I mean, the families that we helped, this is the group of 60 families and we surveyed them. So well, I mean, I can only refer to, to, to this. And this is why I, uh, I, I stated like this. Okay, thank you, Adrian, for that. While I'm waiting for in, and do we have another question here? Let's see, just a second. I have one. I have to just try to read it here. Um, how do I get rid of these things? Oh, thank you. Uh, um, where did it go? Um, this one would be for Dragona or Amelia. If the UN agencies like UN. You in UNICEF, sorry, have a clear stand on not investing in institutions in response to Ukraine. Would either of you be able to comment on that? Um, yes, I, I can comment on that. Uh, I mean, the uh, position of UN agencies is someone uh, tricky because they are intergovernmental agencies and they very often don't want to confront the government they're uh, supporting. Uh, so at, at one, on, on one side, UNICEF is supporting a uh, position of Ukrainian government, but the, on the other uh, side, position of many uh, children rights groups is that uh, children should be placed in families rather than in, in institutions. So there is sort of a going back and forth. I mean, UNICEF is trying to convince Ukrainian government uh, that uh, children belong in families and that childcare system needs to be uh, changed and reformed, but they are not confronting the government directly. They will never do so, uh, as we know uh, that I mean, their specific position of supporting governments uh, is that such that they, they are not criticizing uh, governments openly. So it, it's a struggle. Uh, we don't have a very clear uh, allies if we look as advocates and we would like to see, you know, some more direct 
maybe a criticism of the system. But on the other hand, UNICEF is trying to convince the government to change uh, the system of care and support uh, how for children, uh, including children with disabilities. And then I hope that other agencies will also do that for persons with disability, adults with disabilities as well. I think, as you say, even we've seen this, I, our organization has seen this in Sweden, where we had a very strong uh, children's being placed into families, foster families, where now we're seeing a tendency to put children into smaller institutions. So we have to be aware and biting all the time because these kind of issues just go back and forth, uh, no matter which country we're living in, unfortunately. And then when you have the war as well. Okay. Anyway, I said somebody has their hand. If you said Enos, could you tell me who that was? It was Cesar, and I have just allowed him to talk. So okay, Cesar, good. You should be able oh, to there come I in. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Cesar, the floor is yours, but you need to open your mic, unless uh, Enos will do that. Uh, Unfortunately, I cannot unmute him. Uh, I just asked him to unmute himself, but... Okay. Um... Well, we're waiting. One of the things I, we and in the Independent Living Institute in Sweden, we have had one project called Disabled Refugees Welcome, and now we have a, a continuation. That was to look at the integration process of refugees back from the 2015 to, say, 2020. Now we have the, the new uh, situation with Ukraine and we're going to work on another project with access to work. And one of the, one of the problems that's arise with the uh, we're meeting is where we're setting the refugees against refugees where the Ukrainians have gotten direct, um, are able to get directly uh, uh, permissions to stay, et cetera. And then other people are fighting to be able to stay. So it's, it's not easy, this questions of refugees, whether it's Ukraine or not. But um, Cesar, Cesar, are you now able to unmute yourself? Um, the other thing we're seeing, we've, got, we've come into contact. We're in a, how do you say, we have an informal network working with the Ukraines. Just one moment, Cesar. And Adrian, I see, like, I've heard that people do want to say they want to go back. And then on the other hand, I think I do agree with Lucas, those who have uh, are furthest from independent living are saying they really want to try to stay. And then it'll be depend on what kind of access they actually get, because then it's not so easy not accessing the same social services that other citizens access. Cesar, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jamie. And thank you, everyone, for being here. How come this question is for Katrin, who I thank for being here in front of everyone of us? How can you say that there were no EU funds used for new institutionalization when since COVID came up, we have had no safeguards, no safeguards are put in place for new next generation funding. I don't um. Unfortunately, I think that Katrine had to leave us, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure, Ines, am I wrong? Yes, Anna? yes. Uh, Katrine sent a message that she had to leave. Uh, and maybe just to explain um, for anyone who didn't hear well, Cesar was asking uh, how come Katrin said that the EU funding is not going into institutions when um, there are no safeguards to, to um, help ensure that is the case. Um, so we can, we can certainly uh, send an email to Katrin Cesar 
uh, with this question with you in copy to make sure she she does understand uh, she does get that and she responds uh, because it is uh, very much the case of course that this is happening um, and can I just while I'm speaking Amalia asked me to clarify in relation to um, proposing this memorandum of understanding she did not understand the question well but she said there is a possibility to complain to the CRPD committee about that. So it's something we can, uh, we can do as well after uh, this meeting. And mm -hmm. that is all, Jamie. Okay, yeah, I'm thinking that would be good. We only have four minutes left and we should stop on time. So I'm thinking of just thanking everybody, both you who have been listening, as well as all the panelists for, um, joining us tonight and, and putting this issue hopefully a little bit higher on the agenda. I agree with Dean is that we can complain to the committee about the MOU that we see that we're gonna have a housing crisis. I think that's gonna be in several of the countries which we're going to have to deal with, trying to fight for the right for immigrants or refugees to pin, no matter where they're coming from to be able to access social services as quickly as possible because otherwise uh, life in the new countries are just not possible. That we have the challenge of um, demedicalizing and putting intersectionality on the agenda, of uh, being loud and visible. And um, that's kind of like my short summary of tonight. And for that, I'll thank you very much. And thank Ina very much for organizing this. Ina is all the work that you and the team has done. Thank you for that. I don't know if you'd like to say anything else before we close, Ina. Maybe just to thank the interpreters yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, and the captioner. Yes, uh, but, much. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jamie, as well. And thank you from my side to all the speakers as well. And for those of you who are in New York, I hope you have a good rest of the COSP. Uh, yes, I think that is all. So we can, um, we can close uh, the webinar, Jamie. Okay, thank you again. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.